show of hands, how many of you have ever heard, heard this phrase, you never see a U-Haul or hearse pulling a U-Haul, right? You've all heard that phrase. Why do we, why do we say that? Because you can't take it with you, right? That's not entirely true. Because today we're going to talk about three things that you and I are going to take with us from this earth into heaven. And so uh, whether or not you can stuff it into a U-Haul trailer will be yet to be seen. You'll have to determine that. But today, that's what we're going to talk about. There are three things that every Christian will take with them from this life here on this earth into heaven. Do you know what those three things are? Do you know what the Bible says about your existence in eternity? Well, to start off our conversation, if you have a Bible, whether it's in paper or digital form, form, turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. Luke's in the New Testament portion of our Bibles, Matthew, Mark, Luke. And the context here is Jesus has, has gone to the cross. He's, he's already resurrected from the dead. And in Luke chapter 24, there's a number of different experiences post-resurrection that Jesus has, one of which he's, there's two guys, two of Jesus' disciples. We, we've studied this story. They're, they're walking from Jerusalem to a town called Emmaus when this guy joins them and starts, you know, having this conversation and starts to sort of unpack the scriptures with them. And after they sat down to have a a bite to eat, if you will, Jesus suddenly shows himself to these two men. They call them on the walk to Emmaus. And then they, what do they do? They hightail it back to Jerusalem to say, hey, everybody, we saw Jesus. He is, he's resurrected. He's alive. And so picking up the story, I want you to notice what we read here in Luke chapter 24, verse 36. I left my glasses. I don't know where they're at, so we'll see how this works. Verse 34, 24, verse 36. I might need them. Let me just see here. Here we go. And just as they were telling about it, Jesus himself was suddenly standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. But the whole crowd group was startled and frightened, thinking that, thinking that they were seeing a ghost. Why are you frightened, Jesus asked. Why are your hearts filled with doubt? Look at my hands, look at my feet. You can see that it's really me. Touch me and make sure that I am not a ghost because ghosts don't have bodies as you see that I do. And as he spoke, he showed them his hands and his feet. Stop there. You know, when Jesus rose from the grave and appeared before his disciples, why did Jesus tell these disciples to look at his hands and look at his feet? Why encourage them to touch him? It's because Jesus' hands and his feet would have showcased scars from his crucifixion, right? Post-crucifixion. His resurrected bodies, and we've talked about this a bit already, would have showcased really scars from his life before his death. Are you with me? So don't miss this. The resurrected Jesus did not become someone else. The resurrected Jesus was still the same Jesus pre-resurrection. It's just that now he had sort of the ability to appear and disappear before his his disciples. And in so doing, I think what Jesus is doing is he is showcasing the first thing that every Christian will take with them from this, into heaven, from this life here on this earth. And that is this, point number one in your app notes, write this down. If you're a Christian, as someone who has invited Jesus Christ to forgive your sins and be the Lord of your life, personalize this. When you breathe your last breath on earth and Jesus returns to take you from this earth into heaven, I think when he takes us back, when he takes you back, you will take with you your identity. My identity. Friends, if you are a Christian, when you are transported From this life into heaven, you are still going to be you. Your identity is not going to change. Post-death and resurrection, Jesus was still Jesus, wasn't he? 
Post-death and resurrection, Jesus had markings on his body from his life here on this earth. And so I propose that what he is modeling for us is that what our bodies are going to look like as well. My fingerprints are not going to change. Yes, I will have a body. Yes, it will be dazzling as we talked about last weekend. But I will still be me. You will still be you. Your identity will be the same. Go to the book of Revelation. We're going to spend some time in the book of Revelation today. Specifically, go to chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20, verse 12, okay? Check this out. This is what we're told. So again, uh, John is writing this. He's on this island of Patmos. He has this vision of what heaven's going to look like. John was Jesus' best friend uh, pre-death and resurrection. And he's telling us, he's having this vision of heaven. And this is what he says. I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne, and the books were opened, including the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. The sea gave up its dead, the death and the grave gave up the dead, and all were judged according to their deeds. Now think about this. If we are not ourselves in the afterlife, If our identity does not go with us, then how will we be held accountable for how we lived here on this earth? Judgment will be meaningless. I propose that in the same way that God creates every snowflake unique and special, so too has he created you and me unique and special. Friends, your identity is a -a one-of-a-kind. In fact, turn to your neighbor and say, you are one of a kind. You are definitely one of a kind. The Bible with Jesus illustrates that we will feature and or showcase our God-created distinct identity post-resurrection. Same person, yet different. Now, Scripture is mostly silent as to what we're going to look like in, in God's new heaven and earth, which he will create after Jesus' second coming and the great white throne judgment, when, which we discussed again last week. Not much is taught in Scripture about our appearance. But that reality hasn't prevented theologians over the centuries from discussing this topic as to what we're going to look like, what our appearance will be in heaven. For example, let me give you a couple of Thomas Aquinas, who was a medieval theologian, believed that we will be the same age that Jesus was when he was crucified and then rose from the dead. And so in heaven, Thomas Aquinas believed that every person is going to be 30, 32, 33 years old. And he's not alone. This past Friday night, we were at, I was at the football game, at the Estancia Mesa football game down on the sidelines, and as Nancy Capco and Denise Bauermeister and I were talking about this, Nancy, on her own initiative, says, I think we're all going to be like 33 years old. I think we're going to be the same age as Jesus. So Nancy, like Thomas Aquinas, believes that everybody's going to be at their best. So for those of you who are older than that right now, did you like yourself at 33? Just a thought. Alistair McGrath, who's a modern-day theologian, agrees with Nancy, and he agrees with Thomas Aquinas. In fact, McGrath suggests that if a young child dies early in their life, that their, his or her resurrected body will be what it would have been had they lived to the age of 30 in heaven, however, without blemish. That's an interesting perspective. Dr. Kirk Bauermeister, our current day modern palm harvest theologian, has suggested that in heaven people will you will see people and you will remember them as you experience them here on this earth. And and Kirk's not alone. Many theologians believe the same thing. Kirk believes, as do many others, that if you're a parent, you will see your child when they're younger, and as a child, they will see you as being older. 
you will see your parents as older and they will see us as younger. It's not that our resurrected bodies change or morph into different forms. It's just that we will see each other with different eyes. Our bodies will sort of convey this person who we knew. And to me, that's logical. To me, it, it, it just makes logical sense. But let's see what the Bible has to say. Go to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 17. Matthew, chapter 17. It's the first gospel of the New Testament. Matthew, chapter 17. And Beto's going to have these verses up here. We're going to start reading at verse 1. Matthew, chapter 17, verse 1. Six days later, we're told, Jesus took Peter and his two disciples. So Jesus is pre-death and resurrection. Six days later, Jesus took Peter and the two brothers, James and John, and led them up a high mountain to be alone. As the men watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed that his face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as light. Suddenly, Moses and Elijah appeared and began talking with Jesus. And Peter exclaimed, Lord, if it's wonderful us to be here, if you want, I'll make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Now stop here. I propose that in this experience, Jesus is giving us another glimpse of his heavenly body. In theological jargon, Jesus showcases his, what we call, transfiguration. Have you heard that term? The transfiguration. Now, here in these verses, the Bible writer describes how with Jesus are standing two guys. Who are they? Moses and Elijah. If you were a Jew, you would know them to be Old Testament leaders, Old Testament prophets, who apparently have been transported from present heaven, because remember, future heaven, permanent heaven hasn't been created yet, because that's going to be created after the great white throne judgment. And so my thought is Elijah and, and Moses are in heaven. They're transported to join Jesus. And what I want you to notice specifically is how Jesus' disciples, they recognize both Moses and Elijah. They see them as being distinct individuals. So what's the transferable concept? The transferable concept is both Moses and Elijah have maintained their earthly identity, which is why I'm suggesting that one of the things that you and I will take with us if we're a Christian and that as we transition from life here on this earth, in present earth, into permanent heaven is our identity. Point number two. If you're a Christian, if you've asked Jesus Christ to be your Savior and Lord, to forgive your sins, when you breathe your last breath on earth and Jesus returns eventually to, to take you from here to there, from earth to heaven with him, I propose that not only will you take with you your identity, but you are also going to take with you your name, your name, even your name will be redeemed by Jesus' second coming. If you turn to Matthew chapter 8, and I'm just going to allude to it. In fact, look at it, though. It would be helpful for us. So you can, it's not my words, it's God's word. In Matthew chapter 8, we can read, if you just kind of peruse it, and it's easier to do this in a paper Bible than maybe a digital, but when you look at the chapter in your paper Bible, you can see that if you just kind of peruse the verses, how Jesus is healing a number of different people. Verses 1 to 4 tells us how Jesus heals a man with leprosy. If you skip forward to verses 14 to 17, you'll read how Jesus heals Peter's mother-in-law from a, a high fever. And then as a result of her healing, a number of other people come to the house. And we're told that Jesus, you know, delivers people from demon possession. He heals the sick. Really illustrating how Jesus has the capacity to heal you and me, to heal us from our physical woes. 
But in verses 5 to 13, you can read about an exchange. We can read about an exchange that Jesus has with this Roman officer. And in this exchange, Jesus commends him for his faith because he's asking Jesus to heal his servant. But he says, Jesus, you don't even need to come to my house because as an officer, I give orders and my, my, my servants, they, they, they go do stuff. Just give the word, just give the order. And I know that my servant will be healed. And Jesus says, whoa, what, what kind of faith does this man have? Now, here's what I want you to notice and pay attention to. In verse 11, look at Matthew chapter 8, verse 11. Jesus talks about this, about heaven and this great feast that's going to take place. And at this feast are named, are going to be three individuals whom Jesus calls out by name. What are their names? Let me read it. Matthew chapter 8, verse 11. Jesus says, I tell you this, that, it, that many Gentiles will come from all over the world, from east and west, and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob at the feast in the kingdom of where? Of heaven. Now, friends, think about this logically. Just think about it logically. Don't over-spiritualize this. Why would Jesus reference these three men by name as being present at the feast in heaven if they were going to leave their names behind on earth. And so what I propose that Jesus is telling us in an indirect way is that your name here on earth is going to go with you into eternity. You know, when we read Revelation chapter 20, verse 15, Revelation 20, verse 15, and Revelation 21, verse 7, 27, Revelation 21, verse 7, we are told that the names of Christians will be written where? In the book of life. In Revelation chapter 21, verse 12 to 14, the Apostle Paul writes that, writes how and describes how the names of the 12 tribes of Israel are going to be written on the city gates in heaven. The 12 tribes represent sort of the descendants of the 12 sons of Jacob, right? And he says that their names will be carried into eternity. And so friends, I believe what the Bible is teaching us is that there is this continuity between this life here on this earth and the next. Our names... Really, they tell the stories and the promises of, of, of God. If you're a Jew and you talk about the, the, the 12 tribes of Israel, you can't talk about the trial tribes of Israel without talking about the exodus from slavery from Egypt into the promised land. A person's name tells a story. So think about this. In our present day right now, when your name is mentioned in social circles, does your name foster a positive reaction from people or a negative one? When the name Palm Harvest Church is mentioned in conversation, when people hear that name, Palm Harvest Church, do they think positive thoughts about us or do they think negative ones. One of the things that I love to do, is, as many of you know, is three or four times a year, I will escape into the desert to, to, to take some pastors, lead pastors of Costa Mesa generally on a retreat. And we've got a retreat coming up for just a, well, we Sunday after church, after our Sunday activities, and then uh, we'll go out to the desert and, and somebody helps sponsor our time together. And there's six of us going out to the desert, three of whom have never been on one of these retreats. And one of the guys I've never even met, he's a pastor over at, at uh, Vanguard Chapel. He's been there for a number of years and I've never even met him. And I said, have, I asked him this week, I said, as I was inviting him to be a part of this retreat, I said, uh, Jeff, have we met each other before? And he says, no, but he says, I've heard about you. Ooh, 
I said, well, what did you hear? Which is always a dangerous question to ask. And he said, I've heard that you're a Bible teacher. I was kind of disappointed. I didn't, he didn't say he was sexy or athletic or, you know. But I thought, well, I guess, I guess that's not a bad thing to have a rep- reputation for, for being a Bible teacher. My point is our name tells a story, does it not? Now you say, Pastor Mike, I don't really like my name, this name that my parents gave me. Uh, and, and if I'm a Christian, I don't really want to carry that name from this life into for all of eternity. If that's you and you're a Christian, I've got good news for you. Because the Bible seems to indicate that not only will you carry your name with you, your current name that's on your birth certificate with you into heaven, but catch this, God's going to also give you a new name. He's going to might even give you a nickname. You know, Jesus, think about this. Jesus described himself as the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And so if Jesus had a nickname, uh, maybe we will too, but let's not speculate. Let's ask, what does the Bible say, right? Turn to the book of Revelation chapter 3. There's a couple of verses you can read. Uh, Revelation 2.17 is is the one, but let's just read together Revelation chapter 3, verse 12, and let's see what the Bible tells us about a name that God might give us. Revelation 3 Verse 17, or verse 12, this is what we're told. All who are victorious will become pillars in the temple of my God, and they will never have to leave it. So we're talking about Christians who go to heaven. And I will write on them the name of my God, and they will be citizens in the city of my God, the new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven from my God, and I will also write on them my new name. Go to verse, let's read chapter two, right here. Chapter two, verse 17. Chapter two, verse 17, Beto. Revelation two, verse 17. This is what we're told. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. To everyone who is victorious, I will give some of the manna that has been hidden away in heaven, and I will give to each one a white stone, and on that stone will be engraved, what? A new name that no one understands except the one who receives it. So when you get to heaven, not only are you going to take your earthly name with you, because your name will be in the book of life, but God's also going to give you a new name that no one's even going to be able to understand. How cool is that? Friends, what the Bible writer is telling us here is that as a Christian, when you are ushered from forever into forever heaven, God is going to give you a new name. And so if your name here on this earth carries with it a reputation that isn't so good, or if you have a name that your parents give you and gave you and wrote on your birth certificate that you don't like, don't lose hope, because in heaven, if you're a Christian, God has a new name for you. So, Three things that we're going to take with us into the first into heaven. The first thing is our identity. The second thing is our name. And the third thing is, before I tell you, we're going to pray. Okay, so let's say a reputation prayer. Let's stay in number two here. I want us to pray a repu- what I'm calling a reputation prayer. It's going to be a kind of prayer that says, God, help my name, my reputation to create positivity, not negativity. Are you guys down for that kind of a prayer? Okay, so let's close your eyes. Not that there's anything spiritual about closing your eyes, but just kind of tune everybody out. Take a deep breath. If you're sitting, I think most of us are, just open the palms of your hands. Just place them in your lap or out in front of you. A person's name has value so much so that God is going to have us carry our name from this life into the next. Let's ask him to continue to shape our name and our reputation into something that's positive. So deep breath in, exhale, and I'll say this in your heart. Say, dear Jesus, please reclaim and renew my name. 
please work in my life so that my words and my actions will foster a positive reputation among my peers and family, not a negative one. Jesus, I want my name to be respected and admired so that my name will honor you. A little bit more. So in this moment, pray this. So in this moment, in this prayer, Jesus, I give you permission to transform my life. Transform me, God, into the person who you've designed me to be and want me to be. This is my prayer. I need your help. It's in your name I pray. And everybody said, amen, good. Point number three, let's land the plane. In addition to my identity and my name that I'm going to carry with me into heaven, I propose that the Bible teaches that every Christian will carry with them their genetic uniqueness. You will carry with you your genetic uniqueness. Look at Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7 Verse 9, Revelation 7, verse 9. John describes what he sees. He says, after this, I saw a vast crowd too great to count from every nation and tribe and people and language standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes and held palm branches in their name. Even Palm Harvest's name is going to go there. They were clothed in white robes and they held palm branches in their hands. Now notice, sisters and brothers, the Bible writer instructs us that in heaven, every tribe and language will be represented. Yes? You know what that means, don't you? In heaven, there will be every kind of person incarnated, tall, short, dark-skinned, light, Spanish-speaking, English, German, Swahili, every tongue, every tribe, every nation, every nationality will be represented. That's what we're told here. And guess what? You will likely be able to not only understand all of those languages, but probably speak them as well. Heaven is going to be the ultimate melting pot, and everyone, and praise God, will be untainted by sin's curse. But you know what you're going to leave behind of your genetic uniqueness? You know what part of your genetic uniqueness you're going to leave behind when you get to heaven? You get to leave behind all of your allergies and body pains. Somebody say amen to that. In heaven, there's going to be no pain pills to take. In heaven, there's going to be no inherited heart disease or diabetes or arthritis or cancer or my father-in-law's case, kidney stones. There's going to be no more physical handicaps. Imagine, there are some people who are going to get to heaven and they're going to see for the first time. There are some people who have been born with a physical inability to walk or run, and in heaven, they're going to be able to walk and run for the first time. There will be no wheelchairs in heaven. Everything's going to be new, everything without blemish, and a person's genetic uniqueness will shine in full glory just as God designed it to be in the beginning. I wonder if we'll have crooked toes in heaven. Anybody here have crooked toes or am I the only one? Two honest people in this room, Margaret and me. Listen, no matter what our appearance will be like, Margaret, crooked toes or not, our bodies are going to bring glory to our creator God and delight, and I suspect to ourselves as well. Which means, 
In heaven, there's going to be no arrogance. No, I'm better than you attitude. In heaven, there's going to be no insecurities or an attempt to try to hide or impress. We will be beautiful just as God designed us to be in the beginning. Your genetic uniqueness will be glorious. Jody Erickson Tata, she's a quadriplegic. She's written a book called Heaven, Your Real Home, and she pins this, and I'm going to close with this. She writes, I can still hardly believe it, that I with shriveled hands, that I with shriveled bent fingers, atrophied muscles, gnarled knees, and no feeling from my shoulders down will one day have a new body, Light, bright, and clothed in righteousness, powerful and dazzling. Can you imagine the hope that that gives someone spinal cord injured like me? Or someone who has cerebral palsy, brain injured, or who has multiple sclerosis? Imagine the, imagine the hope this gives someone who is manic depressive. No other religion, she writes, no other philosophy promises new bodies, hearts, and minds. Only in the gospel of Christ do hurting people find such incredible hope, unquote. Friends, here's the bottom line. Sin's curse will no longer have influence on our bodies in heaven. Therefore, I submit that in the same way that Jesus' resurrected body showed the nail prints in his hands and the sword gash scar in his side, that in the same way your body will be healed and renewed post-resurrection in the days to come. It will be glorious, just as God intended it for us to, in the beginning. And that is a heaven that I'm looking forward to. If you've given your heart to Jesus, which I think all of you here today probably have, Jesus has put his name on you. That means that you're not defined by past mistakes or failures. His name is on you. You are a new creation. And so as you encounter people this week, and maybe your reputation has maybe been less than great, and they go, oh, yeah, I remember you, and you just, just admit it and go, yep, you're right, you got me. That's who I used to be, but Jesus is still he's changing me. And he's not done with me yet. That's good news. I'm becoming a better person. And so as you leave today, I leave you with God's authority, sisters and brothers, his spiritual authority to represent him, knowing that his name is your name. If you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus, carry that with your head held up high, knowing that God's at work in your life. I bless you in the name of God the Father, Jesus the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. And amen. Have a great day, everybody. We'll see you next week.